Hey everyone, welcome to today's investment webinar on our latest opportunity, the BP Mezzanine Opportunity Fund. My name is Keshav Kalor, principal and co-founder of Clive Capital. I have here with me my fellow co-founder, John Lai. Hey everyone. Clive Capital helps tech employees and other high earners passively build generational wealth and passive income to achieve financial freedom without having to pick up a second full-time job as an investor. So far, we have helped investors invest passively into over 1,000 apartments under renovation and 500 single-family rental homes under development. Our goal is to build a private equity investment portfolio for you that achieves superior returns and tax benefits while mitigating risk. Eventually, the goal is that you'll have 10 to 30 or more investments paying you every month, allowing you to achieve financial time and geographic freedom and so much more. This is one such investment. Clive Capital is partnering with Bozeman Capital Partners to bring you this opportunity. And today with us, we have Kunal, one of the principals of Bozeman Capital. Thank you for having me, guys. Yeah, happy you could join us today. So this presentation is going to take about 30 to 45 minutes, and we will leave the remaining time at the end for Q&A. In the meantime, as we go along, feel free to throw your questions in the chat, and we'll answer them as they come in. With that, let's get started. Quick legal disclaimer, fun, everyone's favorite part of this. Take time uh, at home, please read this. We won't review this in depth, but please do read this before you invest. A lot of investment financial disclosures were not advisors, anything of the sort. This is for educational purposes only. Okay, at a high level, this is a 506C real estate backed debt fund investment opportunity available to accredited investors only. With monthly distributions to investors and only a one-year lockup on your capital. This risk-mitigated fund has already achieved more than 16% over the last three years that it's been in operation and is projected to continue to achieve 16 to 18% every year conservatively while the fund is active. So what is the opportunity? The opportunity it consists in the transition of U.S. residential housing from low interest rates and rapid price appreciation, just the run-up in home prices that we've seen over the years, and home ownership becoming increasingly unaffordable because while interest rates have gone up, housing prices haven't declined significantly. Not enough to make up for the increase in interest rates, at least. This is making housing unaffordable for most, you know, mom and pop buyers, entry level homeowners. And this creates an opportunity for real estate investors to purchase homes at a slight discount and build rental portfolios and create quality, affordable housing. The primary challenge for them, though, is access to quick, convenient debt capital. And can all feel free to jump in at any point or John to add any color. So who are we investing with? The Bozeman team, they have already deployed capital, you know, originated these loans to over 450 real estate investments across many operators in the form of first lien mortgages. The fund be began deploying capital in January of 2022. So we're coming up on that three year mark that I mentioned earlier, and they've been paying an annualized 21.5% every year. So this opportunity is a pure dividend cash flow play. There is no upside, there is no equity. You're getting paid a straight percentage every year, depending on how our loans and our strategy is performing. Charles McKinney, one of the principals of Bozeman and Kunal's partner, has personally been using the strategy with his own capital since 2019. So for him, He's seen this strategy work for the past coming up on six years already. In addition to that, Charles is also the co-founder of the lending platform, Vontiv, that we are originating these loans through. It's backed by some of the big names in VC, including Zig, Founders Fund, Goldcrest Capital, 
XYZ and 8VC out of the Bay Area. So that synergy between Vontiv, where Charles is a co-founder, and Bozeman, where Charles is a principal, is very you know synergetic. And that's really one of the big things that propels the strategy to the success that it's seen and will continue to see. So the Bozeman team has CEO experience between Kunal and Charles uh, in the mortgage industry and the lending industry and in the real estate industry in general. So what is our strategy? We're going to be producing high yield returns by providing short term debt between six to nine months to experienced real estate operators. The team has access to these operators through lender partnerships with Fontiv and the Bozeman Fund will participate in first lien mortgages through Vontiv and provide working capital to these real estate operators and investors who are scaling their portfolios. Some of the key offering details, this is again a fixed income investment with short duration, six to 12 month mortgages. It's a five or six C investment opportunity targeting 16 to 18% returns per year paid out monthly with only a one-year lockup. This 16 to 18% is assuming dividends are not reinvested. When you get those returns every month, we're giving you the option to reinvest that back into the fund, allowing you to achieve not just 16 to 18% per year linearly, but 16 to 18% compounded when you're able to reinvest that money back into the opportunity. This opportunity is gonna stay open for probably the next six to 12 months as we raise the remaining $23 million with $20 million already in the bank that's been sent out working and lent. The remaining $23 million is available and we will be accepting investments on an ongoing basis. So you can invest again at the end of this month, at the end, at the end of next month, you can invest multiple times until the fund closes sometime next year, once we've hit the $43 million mark. As far as that one-year lockup and the guarantee of it, we've received some questions from our investors about, you know, where is verbiage in the PPM? And in our PPM, we do state that we'll be returning capital. We aim to return capital within 90 days of a written request. And risks, what are the risks with this strategy? We're going to be mitigating those risks, which we will go into, by being very careful about who we originate to, only very seasoned operators who have experience and track record, and we'll go into the criteria later. And we're going to be committing capital at a 25 to 35% discount, meaning that, again, can all correct me if I'm wrong, but housing prices would have to drop by 25 to 35% for our capital to be at risk. Um, hey, uh, hey, uh, Keshav, we have a question that came in. Okay. Is the decision to reinvest dividends a month-to-month -month decision or can it be changed? Um, in, in our deal disclosure, you have the option of indicating reinvestment of dividends. But um, as to the question, uh, Kunal or Keshav, you can answer that. That would be great. Yeah, on our end, it can be changed. So, I mean, as long as you're not changing it every month, ideally. But yeah, if you, if you need to reverse your decision at some point, that's fine as well. Yes, I think for operational perspectives, from the operational perspective on on, on our end, we'd prefer you stick with one, one or the other. Like, hey, I'm going to reinvest every month or maybe a recorder rather than switching between the two. But we are flexible and we can play that by ear. So kind of some of the macroeconomic environment and why this strategy makes sense. As we all know, modern affordable housing is scarce. 90% of housing was built before 2010. The high cost of owning forces many households to rent right now, especially with where interest rates are. And over the last decade, household formation has outpaced new housing, affordable housing formation by about 14 million. So we're just significantly behind in where we need to be in affordable housing supply. So given that's the situation, what is the opportunity? With interest rates being this high and the economy looking recessionary and home ownership being unaffordable, housing prices will decline slightly. And while 
you know, your everyday homeowner might not be able to take advantage of that. Real estate investors are able to do so by buying these houses, fixing them up and renting them out to provide quality, affordable housing. Their main barrier to entry to scaling these quality, affordable housing portfolios is their cost of capital and where they can get their debt. So they're going to look for debt capital to take these investments down and pay a higher premium for higher leverage, which is what we're going to responsibly provide. Folks might think that because interest rates are so high right now, people aren't taking out mortgages, but data actually shows otherwise. Mortgage business purpose mortgage volume, which is the kind of mortgage that we're going to be issuing, have stayed pretty resilient, both through COVID and even the last few years of the Fed increasing rates. So our strategy is to provide capital to real estate investors, investment businesses that purchase and renovate about 25 to 100 properties every year. We're not lending to newbies, we are lending to experienced investors who do this full time and have been doing this with a successful track record in their local market and can turn out new, like new, entry level houses that cash flow for households and families to rent. Again, because of the higher responsible leverage that we're able to provide, many of these investors, these operators are willing to pay a premium to debt finance their acquisition and renovation. And by addressing this niche market, that's how we're able to provide a very attractive return risk adjusted to our investors while maintaining liquidity with that one year lockup on your capital. So how does the fund generate those high returns? Who is borrowing at 16 to 18% per year? That's, ex that's not exactly how it's working. So let's dive into the math a little here. Let's say we're lending out to a fix and flipper at 12% for a hundred K loan. Now, 90K of that is going to be lent by an institution at 10%. And we as the fund are going to be lending the remaining 10K at 12%. So on the 10K that we lend as the Bozeman Fund, what we are going to be investing into, we earn $1,200 in interest for 10K invested. Now notice that there's a spread between the 12% we're charging the flipper and the 10% that the institutional lender is earning. That spread of 2% on 90K, which comes out to $1,800, that comes to us as the fund. Combine that $1,800, that spread that we're able to take advantage of with the $1,200 that we're earning in interest on the 10K that we lend, and we're earning $3,000 on only lending $10,000. That generates a 30% return. That's how we're able to generate these high returns. As far as what these mortgage loans typically look like that we're lending out, it's between 250 to $500,000, a loan to cost of at most 90 to 95%, but on average, we've been sticking to more like 80% to be conservative. The loan to value, is we target 65 to 70%, but we've actually been achieving 61%, again, to be conservative. Interest rate of 12 to 14%. Loan term of six to 12 months. So these borrowers will use it to fix up their properties and they will either sell within six to 12 months or they'll refinance. And that's how they're getting us our interest and our principal back in such a short period of time. Uh, besides that, FICO score has to be pretty high, which we'll go into what our average FICO score is, and a light renovation to mitigate operational risk and make sure nothing goes wrong. Yeah, and also just to add some color here, so these uh, parameters that we've set are kind of on the higher end just to give us more flexibility. But yeah, as Keisha mentioned, we, we've been undershooting pretty much all of these um, so yeah, our, our average loan to cost is, is way below uh, this 90 to 95 figure, same thing with uh, loan to value. So we're, we're pretty focused on mitigating risk. And so, yeah, I, we'll get into the actual metrics later, but 
yeah, just know that uh, we're actually being much more conservative than this would make it seem. Exactly. Yeah, this just gives us the flexibility to go more aggressive should we want. But like Kunal mentioned in the next slide, actually, we'll show what the current metrics are on the fund. And the capital stack. So the senior debt is going to be the institution that is lending at 10%. Now, in exchange for them lending at only 10% and giving us the extra 2%, in the event, in the unlikely event of a foreclosure, the institution gets paid back first. And then we, the fund, are the mezzanine capital. We get paid back next. And then comes the borrower's equity and the intrinsic value. So we are second in line as far as risk goes because the institution gets paid first. But again, for our capital to be at risk, the borrower's equity of 20% would have to be wiped out. And the additional approximate 20% of value that the borrower creates through renovating the property would also have to be wiped out. Hence why we mentioned that figure of capital being committed at a 25 to 35% discount and why housing prices would have to drop 20 to 40% for our investor capital to be at risk. So this is the fund's current metrics. We mentioned the criteria earlier. This is what the fund looks like right now. We have issued about $200 million in debt already to borrowers. 8 million of that is the mezzanine capital and $188 million of that is the senior debt, if you remember from the capital stack picture in the earlier slide. The loan to cost is actually around 82%, not that 90 to 95 figure we mentioned in the previous slide, but 82%. Again, meaning that the borrower has to put 18% down. This is what Kunal was referring to when he's saying that we are way more conservative than the metrics that we highlighted earlier. And again, to continue further on that point, the loan to value is 61%, meaning the market value of the property is you know, that much more than the loan that we have that cushion in case you know, housing prices do dip even more. So far, we've lent out to 450 investments, you know, 450 loans across 200 real estate investors who have an average FICO score of 768, pretty good, across 46 different states and over 100 zip codes. So we're diversifying the loans that were originating across different markets and different borrowers to mitigate risk. I was with a quick point of clarification. These are in our active portfolio, and this is also about like a month old now, so we've, we've grown even more since then. But yeah, there were 450 loans in our active portfolio, but uh, since since inception, I think we've done around closer to 700 loans total. What's the difference between when you say the active portfolio and the extra 300 or 250? I mean, so we, we started in January 2022, right? So some of those loans have paid off and we've had to recycle that capital. So over the entire lifetime, we've probably done closer to 700 loans. Oh, got it. Okay. Okay. Good to know. Um, Kunal, from these metrics, it, it appears that um, repeat investors uh, are pretty frequent uh, with the 700 loans, including the 700 loans. What would you say the number of repeat investors are that you see in, in the portfolio? So if you're talking about repeated exposure to the fund, um, I don't have that metric specifically, but in terms of repeat borrowers to Vontiv, I, I would say like almost all of the investors have done deals with Vontiv before. So right. that, that's how we kind of like, we already have like some sort of historical relationship with these borrowers. So we know that they've paid off loans in the past, which increases their confidence to expose the fund to them. Right. Perfect. Thanks. And again, as a reminder, Vontiv is the lending platform that we are lending our capital through. So what does the capital commitment process look like? How do we decide, or what is the process to originate one of these loans to an investor? It's a four-step process, structuring, underwriting, closing, and servicing. So structuring the loan, this involves the loan application, gathering all of the documents. The underwriting, we make sure that the borrower is in good standing, that they're a good person to lend out to. We check their track record, we check their credit history, we check their you know, financial 
background and what their liquidity is. We check what the condition of the property is. We review title and insurance. A lot of the same things that you would go through if you were buying a single family home. The closing, you know, preparing your loan documents, making sure all your I's are dotted, T's are crossed, that the loan is set up, the funding is set up, and servicing. So monthly payments, admin, and I think this, this one is big to point out is when we're lending out capital for renovating the property, we make sure and we inspect the property to know that progress is being made and that we should continue issuing capital. So we have checkpoints along the way, basically, to make sure that the capital we do lend is being used effectively. So what are some of the things that we use to determine who we lend to? Obviously, character. We want to be lending to good borrowers who know how to use credit responsibly. And what does their profile look like as far as bankruptcies, foreclosures, defaults? Is there any risk there? And what is it? What is their experience? Is this their first one or is this something they've done routinely? And again, we mentioned we typically target folks who renovate 25 to 100 properties every year. Liquidity. This one is big, right? So how what is their ability to shore up any shortfall in capital? If they need more money for renovations, something goes over timeline or over budget, can they come out of pocket and make sure that they can still execute the business plan without risking foreclosure or anything like that. Collateral. When we issue the loan, in the very unlikely scenario that we have to take the property back, does the market support the property value that we would be taking it back at so that we can protect investor capital and not be underwater on our loan? And lastly, how compliant is this borrower as far as, you know, their legal compliance, financial compliance, is there anything to be worried about? We look at all of these things in addition to the criteria in the next slide as far as who do we lend to. So the terms for the mortgage itself, these are typically six month loans. Again, that's one of the big reasons that we're able to provide such liquidity in the fund is that these loans are paid off principal and interest within six months. These are first lien business purpose mortgages and they're working capital loans for property repairs. And we look for personal guarantees and completion guarantees from business owners. Kunal, could you speak a little more to the pers the nature of the personal guarantees and the completion guarantees? Yeah, so basically one of our main criteria is making sure that they're, the bars are personally liquid. We found that that's like a massive flag for potential default risk. And also, so it's kind of beneficial in two ways. One is when we actually get this personal guarantee, that just basically means if they have to liquidate the property at a loss, we can go after their personal assets to uh, basically make up any potential uh, principal capital that was lost. So when we have these personal guarantees in place, the other thing we look for is a lot of assets and personal liquidity to make sure that we can actually make good on that personal guarantee. So um, yeah, that's the personal guarantee. I mean, completion guarantee i mean so we have a lot of strategies to mitigate any issues with completion as well so uh even if for whatever reason the borrower can't follow through on that because vontiv is such a large company and they, they have a lot of connections in local markets across the country we actually also have the ability to partner with other local investors so if we need to finish uh, construction on a property it's not it's not in a state where it can be liquidated we also have the ability to partner with another local operator get that project finished and either listed or they can hold it as a long-term rental and they can just refinance it out so uh we have a lot of nice strategies there as well and these personal and completion guarantees you make sure you get those on every loan you originate correct yep okay so the margin of safety, this is where that 25 to 35% cushion comes in. So the loan to value, the maximum that we will go up to is 75%. Again, remember that we're being very conservative and we're actually doing 60% loan to value, meaning that the cushion is even larger than, the, than what we have here. 
the markets that we're lending in are metros with strong population growth, household formation, job growth, typically class A and class B submarkets, and no rural properties. As far as the borrower criteria, in addition to what we mentioned earlier, we have to make sure that the borrower, the entity is in good standing, good FICO score, no 60 plus day delinquencies in the last two years, and no foreclosure or bankruptcies in the last seven years. And that they're an experienced buyer buying more than 10 properties a year. Again, just another area that we're being conservative. We're actually mostly lending to people who are buying 25 to 100 properties a year. And a big point, like Kunal mentioned, is liquidity is more than 20% of the remaining costs of all of their projects, meaning that they have a good amount of cushion to come out of pocket to finish the renovations to be able to successfully pay a back our loan if they need to. And we make sure that they cannot take on any future debt on any properties that we are lending on. As far as the properties themselves, we're lending on residential homes, not commercial properties. We make sure that they're eligible for conventional financing because that's our exit. Once they refinance us out, that's how we get paid back, our principal and our interest. We make sure that the repair budget's less than 40% of the purchase price and make sure that it's not a heavy lift. If it's not a heavy lift, then there's less operational risk in the borrower's ability to repay back the loan and renovate. And lastly, that there's no title defects that's, and that it's insurable. And a third party valuation is done so that we know, hey, this is what the market property value is at the moment. Now, comparing debt funds to syndications, a lot of you more experienced investors out there are probably looking at other you know, real estate syndications out there right now. Here's why you would consider, a, you should consider a debt fund as a part of your portfolio. One of the biggest feedback that I've heard from our investors, what they look for is really the one-year lockup in a debt fund, such as this one, the Bozeman fund. In a typical real estate syndication, your money is locked up for five to seven years. That lockup poses some risk, right? The longer your money is locked up based on macroeconomic environments, business operations risk, et cetera. Here, you can invest your money for one year, get your 16 to 18% return, and then get your money back if you so choose. Or you can continue reinvesting it. It's up to you. Second is just the nature of the businesses in a debt fund. It provides liquidity for secured mortgage debt, where we have collateral, the real estate itself, Whereas in syndications, on the equity side of things, that's what investor capital is used for. Again, in debt funds, this one specifically, we're investing in over 450 loans across 200 borrowers and 100 zip codes. And that diversifies the risk exposure that we have. Whereas with most syndications, your risk is all in on one building, one market, you know, one tenant, class, et cetera. In debt funds, the risk is sensitive to the amount of mezzanine capital in relation to the senior debt and the interest rate split between those two parties. Whereas in syndications, returns are sensitive to market dynamics and the sponsor's ability to successfully drive up the net operating income of the apartment building or whatever the real estate is. At a debt fund, your capital commitment is at the debt level, right? You are first or in our case, second to be paid out. Someone else, the borrower gets to take on primary risk in case anything goes wrong because of that 20 to 40% cushion that we mentioned. Whereas in a syndication, you're typically committing capital at the equity level. So if any property value wipeout begins happening, begins, you are at risk first. There is no one in front of you. Whereas again, in our case, since we're the lender, the borrower's equity is at risk first. In debt funds, we have the option to foreclose to recoup some of our capital and get our returns back. Whereas in a syndication, the return of capital depends on successful execution of the business plan. And again, you know, we mentioned this, the margin of safety in a debt fund is a lot higher because you have the borrower's equity that you are sitting behind comfortably, 
Whereas in syndication, you, if you're investing on the equity side, you are the first one to be wiped out. So, okay, Shaf, uh, question came in. Yeah. Um, how, uh, back on the previous side, how does the macroeconomic uh, um, environment affect the investments, uh, investment returns, including the interest rates, property demand, and local market conditions? I think we answered a lot of that um, on this slide. But you, um, Kunal, do you have anything to add on this? We will, we'll get into Can that we, in two, three slides. Two more slides, yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. yeah. Good question. So we'll get into that soon. As far as the investment opportunity, the fund is available for up to $43 million, of which $20 million has already been committed. So there's only $23 million left to fund. Again, why we expect closing within next year, like by sometime in 2025. At that point, the fund is going to be closed and not accepting any new investors. Our minimum investment is $50,000, and we are targeting 16 to 18% return per year conservatively. This is assuming dividends are not reinvested. If they are, then it's not just a straight 16 to 18% return per year every year. Your 16 to 18% gets to compound on itself as it grows. As far as how we're investing, Bozeman Capital Principles Kunal and his partner Charles have already invested more than $4 million of their own capital into this fund. And John and I will be he heavily investing into this fund as well. We love the 16, 18% returns and we love the one year liquidity that it offers and just the minimal risk exposure of it all. So distributions are going to happen monthly to you, the investor. The lockup is one year, meaning at one year after you invest, should you choose, you can receive your capital back within 90 days. That's that redemption period. And our investor reporting is going to be through our investor, investor portal, where you will see all future opportunities that are available to you. And we'll include the link to that here later. And I will also mention again that we accept, in addition to just cash as investments, you know, through WIRE or ACH, we also accept retirement funds, 401ks, IRAs, etc. And again, because debt investments, the interest that you earn on them are not inherently tax advantaged, by sheltering your investment in a retirement account, you're able to take advantage of these returns and potentially compound them while either deferring taxes or not paying taxes at all on those investments. Uh, we're not CPAs, though. Consult your own CPA for tax advice. That is just one angle that I like to bring up because a lot of investors, our investors have mentioned that that's something they're looking for. And our minimum investment is 50000 but we like to incentivize our investors who invest higher amounts. The higher you invest, the more return you get, all the way from a 16% return up to a 17% return. Again, we're being conservative in our projections here, and we're not assuming that dividends are going to be reinvested. If you are reinvesting, then your returns will far outpace what we are mentioning here on the slides. Another thing that I will mention is that if there wasn't enough risk mitigation already in terms of who we're lending to, the fact that housing prices have to drop by 20 to 40% for our capital to be at risk at all, Bozeman is also setting aside 50% of their profits to absorb any losses to investor capital. Should any foreclosures happen or anything like that, they will be using 50% of their revenue to protect investor capital and make sure that we are made whole. So now we get to the risks and the risk makings. You might think after listening to all of this that this is too good to be true. That's not true. There is risk as there always is with investments and here's the risks and how we're mitigating it. So number one is borrower default. You know, if someone borrows from us and they can't pay back their loan, the way we're mitigating that is through our lending criteria and due diligence on the borrower. We're making sure that they have a high FICO score, high personal liquidity so that they can pay us back and they can come out of pocket if they need to. They, they are experienced borrowers who run these projects like businesses and the personal guarantees that if 
we need to be made whole on our investments, we can and will go after their personal assets to recoup the loan balance. And again, liquidity matters a lot because Vontiv has found that liquidity has been a huge indicator of default risk, which is why we are trying to mitigate that and making sure that that's a pinnacle of our lending criteria. Now, macroeconomic risk. I think, Kunal, if you could take over here, the strategy works well when interest rates are high because we're able to charge 12%. Could you explain what would happen if the Fed were to decrease rates and how our returns would be impacted by that? Yeah, so it's kind of counterintuitive, actually. Um, our, our position is that if rates decline in the short term, our, our profits will actually go up. So the, 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 reason that, the reason that works is because the interest rate that we have to pay out to the a piece holder that's priced uh, on a spread uh, to this interest rate metric called the SOFA rate. And so the, the, the one-year SOFA rate tracks relatively closely to the Fed funds rate. So when the Fed cuts 50 basis points, uh, the SOFA rate will also fall pretty quickly. Versus uh, the mortgage rate that we actually originate at that that uh, rate actually moves a little bit more slowly. So what what happens is th that that is that's influenced by a lot of other factors. A lot of it is liquidity demand for these type of uh, loans, like from Wall Street stuff like that. So the basically what we think is in the short term we'll see that our expense will drop a little bit, but our mortgage rate that we're originating at and therefore our revenue is actually going to drop less. So so we think that our in the short term, our, our returns will actually increase. I think over the long run, like probably three years or so, like then it might start to reverse and revert back to the mean. But in the short term, that, that might, that'll actually probably be good for us. Okay, yeah. So basically these returns won't last forever. Like Kunal mentioned, we're able to take advantage of the high interest rate environment and generate these returns. Now, all that being said, you know, returns would just drop slightly in delay, but kind of lockstep with where the Fed funds rate at is, but none of us can predict where that's going to be. So now, as far as a recession or other macroeconomic events like excess housing supply, you know, one thing that Bozeman has already done is expected that a lot of housing supply is coming online right now, which it is record levels actually. And to cushion for that, the loans that Bozeman has been originating have actually been more conservative, anticipating maybe a potential, you know, slight dip in housing prices. But even though we're issuing more conservative loans, we've actually improved the returns, the split to investors to make sure that the profit, the returns that investors get, does not get impacted significantly. So we have actually taken less profit to make sure that investor returns stay the same while we can be more conservative in the short term as we see housing supply creep up. And another one is the capital structure, which I, this is one of the biggest ones. Again, there's 20% of borrower equity ahead of us before our capital is at risk. And then additional equity, you know, forced equity appreciation is also at risk because they're renovating the property during this loan term. So they're increasing the property value and, in, and increasing the equity that we have in there. And that's where that 20 to 40% range comes from that I mentioned that housing prices would have to drop by for our investor capital to be at risk. And the last thing is just the liquidity, right? We can, if your money's locked up for five to seven years, like it is in typical real estate syndications, that just poses a larger risk. You don't know what kind of macroeconomic events we're going to go through over five to seven years. But a one-year lockup, if stuff does start going bad in the economy, you can sell and get out a lot quicker rather than having to wait five to seven years and just ride through the pain. Hey, a, a question came up, and this is more a question, not so much uh, for risk and risk mitigants, about the question is, why do you keep a B part at all? Why not lend 100% of the loan value and make the spread on all of it? And I suspect that it's um, due to just the time that it takes to raise equity versus uh, having you know a 
uh, a bank like Vantiv in the back end being able to do that on a quick, quick uh, basis. But uh, Kunal, do you want to expand on that? Yes, yeah, so that's not quite right. So basically, the entire reason that the APs holder is willing to take a lower interest rate on that slice is, is because we exist. So we're we're actually kind of acting as kind of a risk buffer for the APs itself. So if the entire mortgage is paying out 10%, if somebody else had to buy the entire mortgage also, they would also want 10%. They have no reason to take a discount. So the reason they're willing to take a lower interest rate is because we're stepping in for that top roughly 5% of the capital uh, in the loan. And so we, we our existence is actually the reason why, they're, why their spread is there. So the, the reason that the APs holder wants us there is because generally industry-wide, um, there's roughly around like a 3% net credit loss, meaning like if you multiply the loss amount by the default rate, like it's, it comes out to around like 3%. So these these APs holders, they want somebody else to kind of step in and absorb any potential uh, up to 5% loss on their loans. And so because that's a significant service to them, they're willing to take a lower rate. So uh, our edge comes from the fact that since we have basically insider access into, into Vontiv, we're, we're, we're able to be very selective with the loans that we take. Um, the loans that we run the strategy on, we know that they have much lower probability of default than the industry average. And so in this case, it's kind of a win-win scenario where everybody's happy. The AP holder, they're getting uh, the risk buffer that they want. And so they're willing to take a slightly lower return. We know what we're doing. We selected the loan very carefully. So we think that uh, on a risk-adjusted basis, like we're, we're generating a very outsized return. And so, that, so that's how it works. So it, it's not like, there's pretty much no institutional lender that will take a spread for like, give us a spread for free. So that that's why we can't sell the entire loan. The other two risk mitigants I'll emphasize again, before we hop off here and go into the FAQs is again, that we're targeting lighter renovations to make sure to minimize any operational risk. The heavier, the op, heavier, the renovation, the higher the operational risk and the risk that we might not be paid back. And again, Bozeman is setting aside 50% of their revenue to absorb any losses and protect investor capital. And that's just another way that, you know, there's an alignment of interest that we're showing with our investors. So here's the team, uh, Charles Kunal's business partner and Kunal and John and myself and our experiences. And lastly, we will get into the FAQ. So first, how do you protect against, and this FAQ, these are just the questions that we've gotten from our investors so far. If you have any questions that you wanna to add to, please throw them in the chat. So first, how do we protect against concentration risk with too much allocated to any one borrower? Yeah, so I mean, we just have limits in place about how much we lend to any individual borrower. So we, we try to keep borrower concentration below roughly like five to eight percent so since since Vontif has so many borrowers and so much deal flow this is not too difficult for us because we have plenty of qualified borrowers across the country so uh, it's just a matter of just making sure that we, we don't accidentally expose the fund to one borrower too much so yeah what impact do interest rate fluctuations, especially the drop, have on profitability of the fund? We already covered that. I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add there, Kamal. Yeah, I mean, more, more or less what I already said. Um, also, in general, we're always trying to figure out how to get additional yield without taking on more risk. So, I mean, we're, we're also looking into, instead of selling A pieces directly, we're also looking about rolling everything up into a bond. Um, and selling it that way. And so the, the reason we would ever want to do that is because at that scale, um, basically like our our effective cost on that A piece, it, it's much lower in a bond versus if, if we negotiate directly with these other institutions as well. So that's another way that we actually might be able to increase our yields over the next, call it like year, year and a half. But yeah, in general, I think in the short term, we do see uh, yields coming up slightly. So I think the interest rate cuts might actually be good for us in the short term. 
what impact does a recession have on the profitability of a fund, right? Like everything, you know, hits the fan and I don't know, people, would people start borrowing less? You know, what does that look like? How recession resistant would you say the strategy is? Yeah, so historically, so the main thing that we want to be concerned about with is is housing transactions and, and housing prices. So we want we don't want transactions to crash too much because that impacts our, our exit essentially. We we need our borrowers to be able to sell their properties. And we obviously don't want housing prices to crash because then that might impact our, our loan principal. So we've already seen housing transactions crash. So I mean, I, I think it's kind of difficult to see, like even in a recession, I don't think we'll see a very profound further decrease in, in housing transactions. I mean, we we already hit like record lows uh, back in like 2020, uh, sorry, in like 2023, I believe. Um, so I, I don't think that's like a huge issue. A, a lot of people are concerned with house price declines in a recession. Uh, Actually, historically, generally, house prices don't drop in recessions. The only one where it really did was 2008. And that's because that was a credit driven and, and like real estate forward recession. If you go back historically, actually, housing prices don't really decline that much, if at all, in recessions. So that's not also a huge concern for us. I mean, you, you could kind of argue like maybe if we have a massive job loss or recession where maybe like unemployment spikes to like 10% or something like that, then then maybe you could make a case that um, we might have like significant impairment to loan principal. But I think what I kind of tell people is, look, like if you own a rental property, like you're, you're already confident enough in owning like an equity slice mm -hmm. of a single family house. So you, you know, in order to do that, your thesis must be that housing prices won't crash like significantly within like the next couple of years. And so if you're, if you already are willing to be exposed to the equity slice of either a syndication or, or a single family house, like when you're taking a debt position, you're stepping back and going lower in the capital stack. So you, it's objectively safer position. So, I mean, I, I think it theoretically you could make the case that in like some, some scenario we, we can see house price, like massive house price declines, but I, I think it's like not a very high probability of an, so yeah, that's, that's what I say to that. I, I, I think I think it's pretty insulated from a recession. The other good thing about um, having like a fund like this as opposed to a syndication on like a single asset is it's pretty easy for us to wind down the fund as well. So for example, let's say like we see house prices or sorry, housing transactions decline precipitously. And like maybe we think that we don't have the loan volume to sustain like kind of returns that we want. Uh we can just very easily return capital as loans pay off. So we that's also an option for us as well. So I think those th that makes us pretty insulated. Gotcha. Yeah. And we, I guess the other thing is also, you mentioned syndications and real other rental properties as an alternative. If your money's tied up in the stock market, you know, that's not, if a recession hits, it's not like that's not going to be impacted either. At least here, mm -hmm. 16, 18% that you get, that's cash flow to you. That's going to be in your account. You don't have to wait for any appreciation. You can take chips off the table at any time, like Kunal was mentioning. Whereas with the stock market, you're going to have to ride the pain. How do you mitigate single borrower default risk? We covered that as far as the lending criteria, right? Our average FICO score is a 768 of our borrowers. High liquidity. They have to show high liquidity. They have to be buying 25 to 100 properties every year you know, no defaults, no delinquencies within certain time periods. And we also make them sign personal guarantees so that we can go after their assets in the case that we need to recoup the capital that we've invested. And lastly, what does it mean for the fund to be open-ended? Again, we have about $23 million left to raise. Again, since the time of the, the that the slideshow was made, that amount has gone down already as new investor capital has come in. Our limit is $43 million. We're $23 million away. Until that $23 million is available, you can continually invest. You can invest $50K this month. Then you could invest another $50 by the end of the year. Then another $50K 
in January as uh, whatever New Year's resolution that you want to invest more all the way up until we hit $43 million in size. And you can reinvest uh, the earnings that you make as well. That's 16 to 18%. Keshav, a question came in. Um, how many people in the real estate, many people in the real estate uh, industry you use revocable trusts to protect their properties from creditors in the event of default bankruptcy? How do we choose the collaterals? How do we um, typically get back our capital? I would imagine in the case of uh, the trust, trust a use case. Can So you we, uh, answer that? yeah, we, we require that the borrower acquires the property in an LLC specifically. And then we also have a dual on sale clause in the wall. So if they try to transfer a uh, title to a trust, uh, we're able to kind of step in at that point. So we, yeah, we, we don't allow people to purchase these properties in a trust. Great. Thanks for answering. So that's it. To summarize, this is our latest investment opportunity, the Bozeman Capital Mezzanine Fund that we're partnering with them on. The total opportunity is $43 million. $20 million of that has already been committed and spoken for, so you only have $23 million left. The fund will likely be open for the next, you know, call it 9 to 12 months, so you can reinvest multiple times. But it's a first come first serve situation as always. So if capital fills up before that, then you are out of luck. Unfortunately, we're targeting a sixteen to eighteen percent return per year on you know conservatively. We're confident that we can outperform that with some of the things that we're mentioning, and the risk is mitigated. Right, housing prices have to drop by twenty to forty percent for our capital to be at risk. Bozeman Capital is also setting aside 50% of their revenue to cover any losses to investor capital. And when we issue the loan, we're being incredibly conservative in who we're issuing the loan to, to maximize the chance that they'll pay us back. And it's a one-year lockup. Your money's not locked in there. You're not riding with the investment for five to seven years. If you think things are getting bad, after one year, you can sell and get your capital back at any point. So this is a great opportunity. We have our link to our investor portal here on the left, QR code and the link. Not just this investment opportunity, but all future investment opportunities for accredited investors you can find through that portal. And if you have any questions, you can schedule a call with me on my Calendly there, shoot me a text, call me or email me. And we will look forward to partnering with you and with Bozeman on this amazing opportunity.